The Chaos Dwarves, quite like their uncorrupted cousins, are perhaps best known for their roster of powerful artillery and war machines, boasting one of the largest selections in the game. Almost every later game unit in their roster relies on firepower and fire damage, meaning they can melt most foes, but anything with fire resistance is going to cut their damage output by a large chunk. Of course, they still have their extremely heavy armor on their side, so even if they're not one-shotting enemies, they're going to stick around for a very long time, no matter what the opposition throws at them. Sadly, in the early game, this heavy armor and firepower is somewhat lacking, as they're limited to much weaker hobgoblin and laborer units before they can get capacity for those higher tier units. And even in the later game, all that heavy armor comes at the cost of their foot troops being molasses slow, meaning they can be easily outmaneuvered by even moderately quick foes. One last thing they have going for them is their magical laws. Unlike their Dowie cousins, they can use magic and even have a great selection of powerful laws at their disposal to rain fire onto the battlefield. Just before we get into the roster, we should quickly go over a couple of abilities that affect nearly every unit in the roster, Contempt and Malign Authority. Almost every unit in the roster has either one of these abilities, with Chaos Dwarves having the former and Hobgoblins having the latter, with only monsters being excluded from this system. Contempt units do not suffer leadership penalties for seeing non-contempt units routing, and malign authority units gain a leadership buff when nearby to units with contempt. This encourages you to mix and match your units to get the best possible leadership for everyone involved, especially in the early game where hobgoblin units are a lot more prevalent. Okay, let's now get into the roster, starting with the Lords, and starting first with Astrogoth Einhand. Astrogoth is really a jack of all trades when it comes to combat. He has access to a mix of the Laws of Fire and Hushut, so he's capable of laying somewhat real devastation onto the battlefield. Alongside this, he's also excellent in melee with a ton of armor, great melee stats and damage with armor piercing fire and magical attacks. He's even decently fast thanks to his mechanical suit, so he really can do it all. Use him on the front lines, leading your army from the front, taking on basically anything. Of course, try to avoid letting him get into combat versus anything with a ton of armor piercing damage of their own that they can throw back at him, especially when he's on his own. Keep the cast coming as it is a ton of destructive power you'd be missing out on otherwise. There's not much more to him than that, there's not really a bad way to use him, so make sure that you get him involved in every way that you can. Next up we have Drazowath the Ashen. Similar to Astrogoth, Drazowath is a bit of jack of all trades, though he's for sure not as strong in the melee department. He comes with the Laura for Shut, so has a massive amount of fire based damage at his disposal, as well as some powerful debuffs. In melee, he's pretty tough with high armor and defense, but his damage isn't exceptional with high base damage and a bonus versus infantry, but not the most armor piercing in the world. You can still use him on the front lines and he will do well, just try and keep the toughest of the tough units for your armor piercing focused units. Same as Astrogoth, just make sure you get him involved in the front lines and casting as much as possible to get a ton of value. He also comes with one mount, Cinder Breath. This causes him to drop some armor and defense for massive buffs to basically every other stat. He of course becomes a flying unit with a flaming breath ability, but now he's also a great front lines battler with high attack and armor piercing damage. The only real downside is the hitbox increases and reduce defense, so he's a lot more vulnerable to damage despite the massive HP increase. Just watch out for ranged units and let him get surrounded in melee, and he should be fine. And now our final legendary lord is Zatan the Black. Zatan is the pure front lines melee fighter of the legendary lords, with no spells to fall back on. He's got great armor, a shield, and high defense, so is incredibly tanky. However, when it comes to the damage, he's not the greatest. He has high weapon strength, but the armor piercing ratio could be a lot better. This means he'll have to focus his love and attention onto less armored units to make sure his damage is getting through. Once he gets all his items and skills on the go, he'll be a lot better, but in his base form, he'll have to bring something else to get rid of enemy armor. He also has a couple of mounts. First up, the Great Taurus. This loses him a ton of armor as well as some melee stats and overall weapon strength in exchange for flight, a ton of speed and charge bonus, and some more armor piercing fire damage. This makes him into a great charging lord who wants to make the most of the speed and charge to move constantly around the map and charge into unsuspecting enemies with massive damage. You don't really want to use him for sustained combat with this one, since the massive reduction in armor and defense leave him very vulnerable to enemy attack. And the Lama Sue. This loses a little HP and a lot of charge bonus as well as some armor piercing damage. In exchange, he gains much more defense as well as two bound spells from the Lore of Shadows, though to be honest, not the two I'd pick if I had the choice. This is a bit of a lateral move from the Great Tauros since the overall damage potential is much lower, but it can be used with a little less micro thanks to the extra defense, but again with less armor piercing damage. The spells will help him even the odds a little in his favor, but it's gonna be more subtle stat changes than anything explosively obvious. Between the two, it's up to you, but to make it simple, if you can handle the micro, Taurus is probably the way to go for massive solo damage. If not, then the Lamassu is great for frontline's presence and a bit of spell utility. First of our generic lords is the Overseer. These are essentially just weaker versions of Zatan, and since we literally just talked about him, I'm sure you can remember how to use him. Get him on the front lines, but leave high armor enemies for something else. They're tough and act as great anchors for your army, but for sure aren't going to carry them, at least not past the early game. They even have the same two mount choices, which have the same changes to them, to use the same advice as before to make your choice. And our other generic lore type are the Sorcerer Prophets. These can come with the lore of death, fire, a shut, or metal. 
And similarly to the Overseers, these are basically weaker versions of Draswath with stat reductions across the board, but can be used basically the same, but now with the choice of laws. They also now come with a ranged weapon, so can do a little extra damage outside of the danger of melee. This ranged damage is armor piercing, and has some suppressing, and a ton of ammo and decent range. So it's basically what you want to be using at all times until you manage to run out of ammo, but good luck with that. If it does manage it, then melee it is, and they're fine, but not amazing, so stick to lower tier units and basically have them participate without being too daring. And of course, cast as often as possible using your chosen law, but let's be honest, use the shut, because it's the only faction that can. And they also come with three choice of mounts. The Great Taurus, the Lamassu, and the Bale Taurus. This is more comparable to the Great Taurus than the Lamassu. It gains improvements to basically every stat outside of leadership and the range stuff. It also gains the Flaming Breath ability for a bit of added damage. Overall, it's a great improvement and means it can do a bit more damage in melee as well as charging. The melee stats still mean I wouldn't leave it in sustained combat versus anything that can deal real damage, but against low tier units, it should be fine. Still, using cycle charge when you can for the maximum damage possible. Now we come to the heroes, and first up we have the one and only legendary hero that is replacing the legendary lord in this DLC, Godda's Backstabber. He's essentially a buffed up goblin big boss from the greenskins with improvements to every single stat aside from his charge bonus. His damage means he's never going to be the hard carry of your army, but heroes like this really excel when you pick out targets for them. Targets like enemy casters with no support nearby, allowing that base weapon damage and high melee stat to wipe them out before enemies can react. Other than that, he's passable in general combat as long as he avoids super high damage and armor to make sure he survives and his damage gets through. He also comes with one mount, the Giant Wolf. This gives him a massive boost to his speed as well as some HP and charge bonus. Honestly, the speed is the real bonus here as it allows him to sneak around picking off key targets even easier to use that to your advantage, getting him in and out before anything can catch him. Just make sure it don't get bogged down in combat as the larger hitbox can really hurt him versus anything with any damage of its own. First of our generic heroes are the Infernal Castellans. These are very similar to Master Engineers from the regular Dwarves, but come with a few buffs. They're excellent from a ranged, with massive armor pacing and fire damage from a massive distance, meaning they can pick enemies apart from a very safe distance. They're also great in melee, with some more armor pacing and fire, alongside some anti-large for even more kick. The melee stats aren't amazing, but they're good enough, and the armor is super tough, making them very hard to take out. I'd use them from range, stationing them near your other troops until they're all out of ammo or approached by enemies. Using these guys to blob up enemy infantry to keep ranged units safe is a great use of their talents, plus you can then shower ranged fire onto the new blob of enemies and clear them out with minimal risk to your hero. These guys are great all round, so as long as you're using them, chances are they're doing well. Next up we have the Bull Centaur Torox. These are a very strange but powerful unit. They're most similar to Gorbals from the Beastmen, both in terms of their stats and the way they perform in battle. They have high speed and damage alongside some decent charge bonus and melee stats, meaning they can be used for sustained battling or charging around depending on what you need. The large hitboxes do mean they're a little bit vulnerable if they get surrounded, so keep them supported with other fast units or focus on single or weaker targets just to keep them safe. Use them just like you would Gorbals, in hit squads alongside other fast units to get in and ruin an enemy unit's day and get out before you can get pinned down. The charge bonus will do some decent impact damage, but the melee stats are just fine for some light combat against most non-elite enemies. It can also lead a great cav hunting force with the bonus versus large, so keep him on the prowl for suitable targets and send him all over the map with that great speed. And finally, we have the Demon Smith Sorcerer. These are pretty much just weaker Sorcerer Prophets with lower melee best stats across the board. You still have the same magical prowess and the range damage, so honestly, you keep all their best bits and only miss out on the one thing you only want to use in an emergency. Use them exactly the same, avoiding melee combat as much as possible and making use of that ranged firepower and spellcasting whenever possible. Not much more to it since they're literally just the same units outside of melee combat. They even have the same three mounts, the Great Taurus, the Lamassu, and the Bale Taurus. Now we come to the melee infantry. First up, Goblin Laborers. These are like much weaker goblins from the Greenskins with no armor and pitiful stats in everything, making them most comparable to Skaven Slaves. Use them to hold enemies still for your other units to do literally all the damage for them. Just beware that they'll only hold enemies for all of five seconds before their pathetic leadership runs out, so make sure to make the most of that short window of time while you can. Not much more to them than that since they can't fight their way out of the paper bag, so just use them like the meat shield that they are. Next up, Orc Laborers. These are a nice step up in most stats with some actual damage, including armor piercing, but their defense, armor, or lack thereof, and still extremely low leadership mean that they're still gonna run moments after getting into combat. Use them the exact same as the goblins, hold enemies still to let other units come in and do the real damage for them. Only now enjoy them lasting a couple of seconds longer and doing a little bit more damage whilst they're there. Next up, the Hob Goblin Cutthroats. These are an actual step up with some almost passable stats, especially for a tier one unit. You've got a bit of armor, some decent melee stats and weapon strength, even if it's lacking armor piercing. Most units should lack armor at this stage of the game anyway. Of course, they're still going to be used essentially the same as the laborers, only now they're actually going to hold the line for a little while rather than instantly breaking that we've seen so far. Bring in your other units to deal the majority of the damage and keep these guys alive before they break. 
Seems like I'm repeating myself a lot, but all these guys do the same job, just each one better than the last. Next up, the Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits. These lads, however, are here to perform a different job entirely. They're going to be used to sneak around enemy lines and either get into their ranged units or sandwich the front lines. Their high speed, poison and bonus versus infantry make unsuspecting ranged units into easy targets as long as they don't get any assistance. Against front lines, they'll want to use the sandwich to ensure they don't take too much damage with their low defense and the poison will go a long way in making them easy to take out. Add on the backstabbers passive and as long as you get them fighting while they're still healthy, you should have a great time. Their missiles are basically left some burst as they end combat, also make sure to turn off fire at will so they don't give themselves away during a flank and turn it back on as they're making their charge for some extra damage and poison to make for an easier target. Next up, Chaos Dwarf Warriors. Would you believe it if I told you they are exceptionally similar to the regular Dwarf Warriors but just a little bit better. They have a little increase to both melee stats and weapon strength and swap spell resistance for fire resistance, but are pretty much identical aside from that. That's not a bad thing, however, as it means they're still great line holders with excellent defense and some passable damage for such a unit. Still, use them to hold the line, only now they're actually going to do that for a very long time, as long as they're not up against anything with high armor piercing. Keep them supported with high damage units to take out what they're holding back, and they should have an easy time of it. Just make sure the enemy comes to them and doesn't get their flank off as repositioning can be agonizing with their snail-like speed. They also come to another variation, Great Weapons Chaos Dwarf Warriors. Yet again, basically the same as the regular Dwarf's version, but with better melee stats and damage. Compared to the base variant, they lose a big chunk of defense to gain a ton of armor piercing damage and charge bonus. Personally, I like to use my infantry as line holders, and the reduced defense makes them worse at that, so they're not a great pick for me. However, if you're more aggressive, the extra damage can work in the same sort of playstyle. It's just a lot riskier to your infantry and requires a lot more coordination to take enemy front lines out as quickly as possible. I'll leave that up to you, but personally, I'd stick with the regular warriors for a nice, solid anchor to work around. Next up, Infernal Guard. These are basically just a massive step up from Chaos Dwarf Warriors in every way but speed, where they somehow lose just a little bit more. Outside of that, however, they're an incredibly tanky frontline that is nearly unmovable with the massive armor, defense, and leadership. The damage isn't amazing, but of course, that's what other units are for. These guys are here to hold enemy units still, not deal all the damage, so have them hold the line and wait for support like anything else. They also come in another variation, the Great Weapons Infernal Guard. Like the Warriors, this is a big drop in defense for some large gains to armor piercing, and just like in the Warriors, I'm not the biggest fan here since I want my front lines to be as tanky as possible. That being said, they're still super tough with higher defense than some factions endgame line holders, as well as incredible armor. You could use them if you wanted more damage in your front lines, and you weren't worried about the drop in defense, but of course, you just need to stay on top of eliminating whatever they're fighting as fast as possible, as well as protecting them from any range damage. I still prefer the regular guard, but if you're feeling more aggressive, go right ahead. And our final melee infantry units are the Infernal Ironsworn. These are the endgame infantry of the Chorfs and one of the tankiest units in the game. They gain even more armor and melee stats from the guards, as well as some limited armor ranged units to use just before they get into melee. Think of these as the Ironbreakers of the Chorfs, but now they have magical flaming attacks, so enemy physical resistance is useless against them. Still, you're gonna wanna use them the same as the guard, so hold the line and keep enemies still, only now they'll have a bit of burst ranged firepower to soften enemies up a little bit more before they get pulled into combat. Keep an eye out for enemy flanks before they get too close to make up for their pitiful speed, and they should do great. Now we come to the ranged infantry, and first up we have the Hobgoblin Archers. These are pretty much just weaker Hobgoblin Cutthroats in melee, but now they have some passable range damage. They have a medium range and plenty of ammo, but pretty low damage, especially if their target has any ammo. The fire damage is nice, but doesn't do too much to help with their armor problem. Have them assist your front lines, focus on the lowest armor targets you can find to make the most of their damage. Keep them out of melee if at all possible, as they are pretty pathetically weak and will die or break in seconds. Try to get them a good angle if you can, but not if it's too risky. They can shoot overheads if needs be, so it's not super worth getting them killed for a slightly better damage per second. Next up, Chaos Dwarf Blunderbusses. Compared to the Dwarf Thunderers, they are an interesting change. They're a little better across the board when it comes to everything, but ranged, and then it gets a little bit more complicated. They have a ton more missile strength, and it's all armor piercing, so they can rip most tanks to shreds in just a few volleys. However, their range isn't the greatest, and each of their shots fire three projectiles that don't deal explosive damage, but still have enough kick that they can knock most enemies to the ground, slowing their movement quite a bit. Of course, they need line of sight to hit their targets, so get them an angle at all times to ensure they keep pumping their very respectable damage. You can deploy them ahead of your melee troops before moving them back once enemies approach if you want, just move them earlier than you think you need to, to account for the sluggish movement speed. After this, you'll want to try and get an angle on the front lines, just keep an eye of enemy units catching them out in melee, as they're not great in combat, and it is a massive waste of their damage potential. You can also choose to focus fire on large targets from the back lines, if you want to keep them a little safer, as they'll have no problem shooting over your unit's heads to snipe anything giant. Whatever you do, keep them firing, and you can't go wrong. And finally, we have the Fire Glaives Infernal Guard. On the range side of things, these guys are a lot more like traditional handguns units, with just a single projectile and a longer range, so it's a little easier to get your range value out of them. 
You'll still need line of sight, so an angle to do good damage, only now you can get that angle from a safer distance. On the melee side, they're also seeing a massive buff being on par with the warriors for their ability to fight on the front lines. They have armor piercing, anti-large and fire damage, so it can take on most foes and come out the other side looking pretty good. Of course, I'd keep them firing as much as possible since their damage is so much safer, but if they get caught out or run out of ammo, they'll still put in work. And yes, if you're boring and have the capacity to spare, they'd work well as a doomstack. We wouldn't do that, would you? That'd be cringe. And you're not cringe, are you? Moving on now to the cavalry, first up with the Spear or Goblin Wolf Raiders. These are a much improved unit over the regular Goblin Wolf Riders from the Greenskins. Aside from the drop in HP and models, basically everything else is seeing improvements, making them perform the same job, but even better. That job is of course to use their high speed to flank the enemy army and take out any defenseless range threats before they can get much value. Their speed really is their only power since pretty much everything else about them is still pretty weak. The damage is fine, but with low melee stats they're not going to hold up against anything that's actually built for fighting. Stick to range targets and wipe them out as quickly as possible before pulling your guys out if support comes near. You can have them charge the backs of the front lines, but I'd stick to cycle charging rather than sustained combat to minimise the damage they take as much as you can. The leadership is still super low, so avoiding actual conflict as much as possible is a must to get more than one charge out of them. Next up we have the Bull Centaur Raiders. These are most similar to Minotaurs from the Beastmen, but actually a little better in most stats. They're as fast, but have more armour, as well as great melee stats, both attack and defence. They make for great hit and run units that can flank enemy lines and charge into basically anything with stats like these. Or you can send them straight into reinforce the front lines and give them some added beef, also, with the firepower of the Chorfs, you don't really need them there, especially since they might catch some stray missiles. Overall, they're a great unit, and even with their less than blazing speed, it can get around most forces of these and target basically whatever takes your fancy. So keep them flanking and start fancying something. They also come with a couple more variations. The Dual Axe, Bull Centaur Renders. These drop a little defense to gain some attack, charge bonus, and anti-infantry damage. This, of course, makes them into anti-infantry specialists that can take out back lines or front lines with ease, depending on what is needed. Again, I'd stick to back lines to keep the sight lines clear, but if you want to do a more monster-centric army, then go right ahead. Just be cautious of them getting too deep versus super high damage, as they don't have the most armor in the world, and even with their respectable defense, they will start to take hits when surrounded. And our other variation is the Great Weapons Bull Centaur Renders. Great weapons lose even more defense to gain a slight buff to attack and charge bonus, as well as the anti-large bonus damage. This makes them into great large target killers, whether that's mounted lords and heroes, enemy cav or even monsters. They can cut through most targets with ease. Of course, they can still do the same stuff as the other two variants, but if you got that bonus damage, why not use it? Focus on targets they can proc their bonus damage on first before coming back to take down anything that's left. Just don't let them get kited by faster cav, as they still aren't blazing fast with their considerable girth. Next we have our one and only ranged cavalry unit, the Bow Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders. These obviously lose the melee efficacy from the spears, but in turn gain their bows, which get them some decent flaming missile damage from a medium range. They can fire on the moves to make for excellent skirmish units with their high speed, meaning not much can really catch them as long as they don't get trapped. Alternatively, you can use their speed to get them around the backs of enemy lines and fire into the backs to break them as fast as possible from a safe distance. No matter what you use them for, just avoid getting trapped in melee combat, as they really will not do too well and will likely die or run away in moments. Now we come up to the Monsters and Beasts. These are very similar to when the Lords are using them as mounts, only with some minor stat differences, including a decent nerf to their leadership. Still, you can use them to cycle charge enemy units, either from flight or landing first before you charge. Either way, keep them on the move at all times in and out of enemies to minimise damage taken as their defence really can't keep them safe versus anything. They can do this versus backlines or the backs of front lines with their massive damage and charge bonus. And on their high speed, and not much can really stop them from doing this either. As I said, avoid sustained combat to keep them safe, and they should do great. Next up, we have the Lama Su. Similar to the Great Taurus, it works pretty much the same as it did when it was a mount. From the Great Taurus, it's a bit of a lateral move, with it losing some charge bonus and attack to gain a lot more defense and some leadership, as well as the bound spells. This makes it a little better at sustained fighting and support, so works well on the front lines alongside other units. Of course, with large hitbox, I'd still advise against letting it get surrounded by elite damage enemies, but for sure, assisting melee troops on the front lines is a great use of his time. Use the spells to weaken enemy forces and break them as quickly as possible, so you can push through to more vulnerable back lines. Of course, with that high speed, they can take on enemy range and artillery, just don't let them get pinned down while support moves in, otherwise, they'll go down fast. Next up, we have the Bale Taurus. It's pretty much a direct upgrade to the Great Taurus, just getting more of what made the original unit so good with stat improvements across the board. The only ones that don't see improvements are leadership and charge bonus, but aside from that, they're better in every way. They also pick up a flaming breath ability, so can use it to devastate groups of enemies before moving in for a charge. And of course, charging is still the best way to use them. Yes, with the improved stats, they can still do a lot better in sustained combats, but AE charge is still AE charge, so make the most of it and keep them on the move as much as possible. Next up, we have the Kadai Fireborn. The closest unit I can compare these guys to is the Necropolis Knights with Halberds, but really, these guys are a pretty unique and seriously powerful unit. Their speed is pretty great for land-based troops, so they'll have no problem keeping up with basically any infantry. And their damage is outstanding with armor-piercing magical fire and bonus versus infantry, meaning not much can really stand in their way. 
The melee stats aren't outstanding, but they're good enough and when they do hit, it packs enough punch to make up for any misses. Use them alongside your front lines to melt through basically anything the enemy can send against you. Just make sure they don't go off on their own and get surrounded as their hitbox size and moderate defense can spell a quick doom. And lastly, we have the Kadai Destroyer. It's basically just a bigger single entity fireborn what more is there to say? It has less defense and charge bonus, but every other stat gets major increases, including weapon strength and attack, meaning the damage output on this thing is bananas. Combine that with the decently tough armor and you have a seriously powerful unit on your hands. Of course, the downsides are mainly the massive hitbox, meaning enemy ranged can focus fire for an easy kill, or infantry can surround it to focus it down, but as long as you avoid both of these threats, it's nearly unkillable. Get involved in the front lines, providing a ton of damage presence just by being there, keep it supported with your other infantry units, and it should wreck up a ton of kills. And finally, we come to the artillery and war machines. First up, the magma cannon. I mean, it really is all in the title. It's a cannon that shoots magma. I mean, technically, it's molten metal, whereas magma is molten rock, but I digress. Aim this at blobs of enemies and watch them literally melt from just a single shot. The impact area seems to stay molten for quite a while, dealing massive damage to enemies hit and stuck in the area, and taking out some of the toughest armoured units in the game with ease. It says it's an armour piercing, but it still hits incredibly hard versus most targets, just find the biggest blob that you can and rain literal fire on it. With a massive range like this, you'll struggle to never have a target, so keep it firing constantly for easy value. Of course, don't let it get trapped in melee. Yeah, it has great weapon strength, but those melee stats are pathetic, so it's not going to last two seconds against anything that can actually fight. But of course, it's an artillery piece. What else would you expect? Next up, we have the Iron Demon. And if ever there was a unit deserving of the title of War Machine, this is it. It's a train, but of course, it's traveling far off the rails with great speed and massive damage. The melee stats are okay, but not amazing, so keeping it charging in and out of combat is the way to go to maximize damage. You also have some mid range missile damage you can fire off in between charges for massive damage just before impact. This can be done on the move, so as long as you let them fire at will, they'll let loose volleys automatically as they charge around the map. And to top it all off, they're unbreakable so can be charging around until they're the last thing left in battle. Just don't let them get pinned down in melee or focus fine for a range, and they should choo-choo your army all the way to victory. Next up we have the Hell Cannon. This is the exact same unit that the Warriors of Chaos have access to, which makes sense since it's always been the Chaos Dwarves that have been operating it. If you've used it before, you know how to use it, but just in case you haven't, let's quickly cover it again. It is a standard artillery unit with a large firing arc, so that means that sitting at the back of your army is the best place for it. With no speed or melee stats, it's easily taken out by flanking enemies, so give it plenty of protection to keep it safe. From this safe distance, you can rain fire with high damage seeking missiles that can punch through armor and resistance with ease. As long as it's firing, it's getting value, so aim for the biggest blob of enemies that you can to maximize their damage with powerful explosions. Next up, we have the Skullcracker, and this is statistically identical to the Iron Demon, but has 20 less HP and no missiles. So you might be wondering why you'd ever go for it. The answer is Wallbreaker. This machine can chew through enemy walls like they're nothing, giving your troops an easy entrance into enemy settlements without needing to wait for towers or battering rams. Yet, yeah, it's a bit of a shame that such an elite unit is only really useful for eating walls and gates, but if you do bring it, it's still great for charging enemy infantry, just like the demon, only with a little bit less ranged utility. Next up, we have the Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher. This is the Chaos Dwarf version of the Eagle Claw Bolt Thrower, meaning it has two fire modes. Death Shriekers, which detonate in the air for more area damage, which is better versus clumps of units, and Demolitions, which do not detonate and gain more armor piercing damage and anti-large. This makes them into great multifunctional artillery pieces that can target blobs of infantry just as easily as they can target single entities. Sadly, this does mean that most of the time you'll need to manually pick targets rather than just leaving it on fire at will, but if you can manage that teeny bit of micro, you should be just fine. Pick your ammo type and your targets and sit back and watch the fireworks. Next up, we have the Dread Quake Mortar. This technically has less damage than the Death Shrieker, as well as a shorter range and less ammo reserves, but it is still a more elite unit and a better pick. The reason for this is the speed. This is essentially a standalone train cart, so it can zip around the battlefield at high speeds, meaning it can run through enemies or get to a better firing position with ease, making it a lot safer to use. Plus, the damage is still devastating with a massive explosion radius, dealing huge damage to everything caught in the radius, as well as slowing them from the monstrous impact. Use it the same as any artillery piece, firing from a safe position onto the largest blob of enemies you can to maximize the damage. Use that speed to keep them out of trouble and avoid melee at all costs, as the stats really do not add up to a great combat performance. There's also a couple of variations of Dreadquake Mortars. The Iron Demon, it's literally just a Dreadquake being towed by an Iron Demon, so has the ranged firepower of the regular mortar alongside the melee prowess of the demon. To be honest, I'm not sure outside of novelty why I'd go for it since you're still going to do the best damage from long range, so the only time melee damage would come into effect would be once it runs out of ammo. Yeah, it can fire on the move, but still, I'm not sold. Visually and conceptually, it's really cool, but as far as practical battle use, it comes off a little bit confused. You also have the Skullcracker, and it's the same story here, only now you can break walls of it, making it a little bit more viable rather than having to bring a separate unit just for walls. Still, it's a bit of a novelty outside of this niche use, however, so use it at your own discretion. And now we come to the Regiments of Renown. The Blazing Beards of Batarak are Chaos Wolf Warriors, and gain a low ammo ranged attack, flaming attacks, and frenzy. 
The Immortals are Infernal Ironsworn and lose their ranged attack and melee stats, but gain weapon strength, charge bonus and anti-inventory bonus damage, as well as an Undying Will passive ability. The Granite Guard are a unit of Chaos Dwarf Blunderbusses and lose shielded, speed, melee attack and missile strength, but gain most stats aside from leadership, ammo, range and armor piercing melee. They also gain the Dig In passive ability, as well as suppressed imbued missiles. The Shut's Dark Ravages are Bull Centaur Renders and gain missiles, can fire whilst moving, Reveling Fear, Guardian and Physical Resistance. Old Gar Khan's Wolf Boys are Bow Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders and gain improvements to every stat except speed and their missiles, as well as Flamble Imbued Missiles and the Pelter Wolf Ag ability. The Soul of Damnation is a Hell Cannon and gains ammo and the Soul Devourer passive ability. And the Demon's Tongue is a Nine Demon and loses melee stats and range to gain ammo and missile strength and replace suppressed imbued missiles with burns. And finally we come to the Army Compositions. Every unit in the game is one of three tiers so we're going to use those to make three compositions for the early, mid and late game. The Chaos Dwarves also have a capacity based system for their more elite units so in campaign you might have to build up to these comps rather than getting them instantly, so just do your best to build up to them without compromising other areas of your campaign. First up, tier 1. We're going to lead our army with an Overseer. Early on, going to be doing well in melee and lead your army from the front. Between them and the Sorcerers, I went for these guys since the casters are basically the same for the Lords and Heroes, so we might as well have a stronger fighter leading our troops. For the front lines, we're going to go with 6 Hobgoblin Cutthroats. They are the best front line we can get at this stage, and they're good and cheap, so what more can you ask for? We're going to act as line holders and work with your other units, stacking as much damage as they can to break whatever they come up against. Our six Hobgoblin Archers are going to be the main damage dealers for this stage of the game. They're going to struggle against armor, but with enough focus firing, they can chip away basically anything. The three Hobgoblin Sneaky Gits are going to flank enemy front lines and sandwich them to break them as fast as possible with attacks from all sides, especially with their high damage. And the Spear Hobgoblin Wolf Raiders are going to use their great speed to get around enemies into their back lines and take out ranged units to protect your army before coming back to cycle charge front lines or chase down anything that's retreating to make sure they're shattered. In tier 2, the Overseer should be on a mount by now and have a lot more damage and speed, allowing him to take out key threats like backlines to keep his army safe. Or he can focus on assisting front lines with cycle charging to keep himself safe and provide steady bursts of damage where most needed. We're going to pick up a couple of heroes, an Infernal Castellan. This guy's going to stick with your ranged troops to provide some leadership and massive damage from his own missile strength. He can also be sent into melee to protect your ranged troops when needed with his very respectable stats. We're also picking up a Demon Smith Sorcerer of Hushut. Of course, we're going with Hushut because it's the Chaos Dwarves and we want magical power in our battles. This guy will start out kind of mid, as all casters do, but will quickly become more powerful, providing damage and utility wherever needed in combat. We're upgrading our front lines, six Chaos Dwarf Warriors. These are a real tough front line, and if you can get capacity, it will provide a sturdy foundation for your army to work around, as they'll take a long time to be beaten, allowing other units to come in with all the real damage. We're going to go with seven Chaos Dwarf Blunderbusses. Speaking of which, these guys are going to provide most of that damage with massive ranged firepower that can take down almost anything if fire is focused enough. Of course, they'll need some good sightlines to get shots off, so move them to get a good angle and watch them tear enemies to pieces. I'm going to go with two Dual Axe Bull Centaur Renders, as well as two Great Weapons Bull Centaur Renders. Both of these are going to use their high speed to get past enemy front lines and into more valuable targets. The Dual Axes are going to focus on ranged infantry or artillery to take down any ranged threats as soon as possible, and the Great Weapons are going to instead focus on enemy cavern monsters to make the most of their anti-large bonus damage. Finally, we come to Tier 3. The Overseer should be in final form on amount of your choosing. I went with the Lamassu for the spell utility as well as the damage, but the Taurus is still a great pick for high charging potential. The Infernal Castellan will still be doing pretty much the same thing, just with a couple of abilities under his belt. The Demon Smith should be on a mount with a full spellbook to be a terry in battle and casting wherever is needed, as well as getting involved in combat as much as possible to make the most of their vast stat improvements. For the front lines, we have six Infernal Iron Swan. These are the end game front lines, and yes, getting enough capacity is expensive, but so worth it for everything they bring. They're going to hold the line basically forever and allow your arm to deal the damage almost at their own leisure. For the ranged infantry, we're going to go with five Fireglaive Infernal Guard. These are going to do the same as the Blunderbusses, only with a little bit more range and some decent melee prowess if enemies manage to break through to them. We're going to go with two Kadar Destroyers. These are going to assist on the front lines to provide a ton of damage with their massive area attacks. For our artillery, we're going with two Death Shrieker Rocket Launchers and two Dreadquake Mortars. Of course, the Death Shriekers are going to be used to target basically anything on the map with a preference of single entities to allow the Dreadquakes to focus on infantry. Of course, that's what they'll be doing, finding the biggest clumps they can aim at for massive damage to everything caught in their very large radius. And that is just about everything you need to know to play the Chaos Dwarves in battle and we have a campaign guide coming next, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that. And if you want to know how to play all the other factions in Mortal Empires while you wait for the Chaos Dwarves to drop, then check out this playlist for all my other faction guides.